<laughs> Amanda Carter and her sister were out on the town celebrating her 22nd birthday. But the cheer would turn to despair when Amanda failed to come home. The description given was that the driver had a head like a bastard pig. Her hands were raised above her head like that. This is a real potential suspect. I mean, how many people with red beards would be wandering around Hobart? Somewhere along the line, he would make a mistake or somebody would give him up. You prove it. If you think I did it, you charge me. And if it wasn't Mandy, where did Mandy go? And he was interviewed as to whether he'd had sexual intercourse, and he said he hadn't. I remember saying to him, well, you, you want to get used to it, because there'll be more of these interviews. I suppose he thought he was a free man. All these years have gone by, and uh, we perhaps have got our man. When Amanda Carter disappeared, her killer thought he'd got off scot-free, but he hadn't considered the future. A revolution in forensic science was about to happen, and a team of detectives had a very long memory. Mr Carter had reported his daughter missing to the police, and they were concerned about her, her safety, basically, um, because it wasn't in her nature to not go home of an evening. They told us Mandy and Debbie had gone out on a Saturday night to celebrate uh, Mandy's birthday, which was on that uh, following Monday, um, that they were a very close-knit family. Mandy, Debbie and Brenton still lived at home. Very nice environment for a young girl to grow up in. A very loving, warm family, and normally uh, we wouldn't be that concerned about somebody age 21 not arriving home but uh, they assured us that uh, she regularly came home. We went through uh, her belongings there to, to see, for example, if there was any clothing missing, bags missing, uh, bank books missing, which would indicate to us perhaps that she'd uh, run away or wasn't going to come home that uh, night, but um, there was nothing to indicate that. So the warning bells rang fairly early in the piece and it didn't seem to be just a normal missing person. Immediately, police started to piece together what they could of Amanda's last movements. Debbie, uh, who the sister we spoke to, she told us that they'd been to a number of hotels the night before. They had been enjoying themselves in the evening. They'd had a little bit to drink, and after midnight, when they were down at the Hope and Anchor, Debbie didn't have a very good recollection at all of what she did, who she was with, and where her sister was. A lot of people had talked to her at Mandy Carter, but there was nothing to suggest that she was going to do anything out of the ordinary. Everybody that we spoke to that knew her said that they thought she would go home by a taxi, and that was her usual method of getting home. So we made, started making inquiries with taxi companies just to ascertain as to who was working that night. I was driving cab 99 um, in and around the, the Hobart area. It was a rather busy night. I told police that I'd seen uh, a figure hunched up in the doorway of the old CML building at around about quarter to three, three o'clock in the morning. In fact, a number of taxi drivers reported the same sighting. Nobody could say for sure that was Mandy Carter. A lot of people said it looked like her and uh, it seemed a logical taxi rank for her to go. However, the times of the sightings varied between 1.30 and 3.30 a.m. But about three taxi drivers said that they saw a yellow taxi at the front of the cab stand and in the area where this girl was sitting on the steps. One of the taxi drivers had seen a taxi driver go up to the CML steps and pick up a handbag and throw it into the taxi. This taxi was right in front of him. So he, he identified that taxi and it was cab 58. 58's picked up a handbag. That was obviously an avenue inquiry we wanted to seriously look at because Mandy had a handbag with her. 
So there was a possibility that this handbag belonged to Mandy Carter. One cab driver even suggested to us that he thought that the girl sitting on the steps actually got into that cab and the cab drove away. Now, if that was the case, uh, we may have Mandy Carter leaving the CML steps and it was important that we get hold of that taxi driver as soon as possible. Amanda Carter's 22nd birthday dawned. She had been missing for 24 hours. Police began searching Hobart for any sign of her. They were also on the lookout for a yellow cab, number 58. The yellow cab was uh, owned by a fellow called Wayne Highland. I think it was about the only yellow Falcon on the road at the time as a taxi. And about five o'clock, we actually found him out at the airport. So John Blue and I went out there immediately, uh, found Highland with his cab, and when we opened the boot, we found a handbag in the boot. Uh, he told us that he'd found it at the CML steps on the Saturday night, Sunday morning, and he had intended to hand it into the cab office, which he hadn't done. If she's got Mandy's handbag in the car, well, there's a potential that you know, Mandy was in here as well. So he must know something. We thought this is a real potential suspect. Amanda Carter had been missing for 48 hours when police found what they believed was her handbag in the boot of a yellow taxi. That taxi was impounded and the driver, Wayne Highland, was now being questioned. We spoke to Highland at the um, police headquarters. He told us that uh, Saturday night, Sunday morning, he'd been at the uh, GPI. He'd spoken to a female there who has been sitting on the steps and asked her if she wanted a cab. She said she didn't and she was waiting for a friend. He then got back into his cab and drove around to the cab rank in Murray Street outside Mire. He got a fare there out to Windermere. back into the city, went back to the GPI, and uh, he then said that he went up to the steps again and there found a handbag. This was the handbag that we found in his car. The woman that he'd spoken to on the GPI steps, he wasn't obviously able to identify her as Mandy Carter because he didn't know her, but from the description that we gave him, he said it could have been her. Was the girl he saw Amanda Carter? And if so, who was she waiting for? More importantly, at this stage, was the bag picked up by the taxi driver that of Amanda's? We were pretty confident it was going to be Mandy Carter's handbag, but there were no credit cards, no identifying things in the handbag at all, but it was very similar to the handbag that uh, had been described as being Amanda Carter's handbag. So we went down to Taruna um, and spoke to Mr and Mrs Carter and Debbie, showed them the handbag, and uh, to our bewilderment and uh, astonishment, they said, no, it wasn't uh, her handbag. And they were quite adamant about it, and we said, well, we think it is. And they said, no, sorry, it's not her handbag, and uh, we know her handbag, and that's not it. So straight away, we gave a lot of media and we said, here's a handbag, we want to know whose it is. Detectives have interviewed the taxi driver who found the handbag and who had previously talked to the woman, asking her if she needed a cab. The woman is of similar appearance to Mandy Carter and police urgently want to talk with her. We looked at different scenarios. One possible scenario was that she'd picked up the wrong handbag when she left, left the Hope and Anchor and that somebody else had Mandy's handbag. But if that was the case, nobody came forward with Mandy's handbag. Another scenario was that Mandy Carter wasn't on the CML steps at all. And that uh, it was some other female, and who was she? And if it wasn't Mandy, where did Mandy go after she left the Hope and Anchor? Luckily, Amanda's sister Debbie started to recall events of that night at the hotel. Debbie was able to recall that she and uh, Amanda departed from the Hope and Anchor Hotel the early hours of the 27th in company with two male companions. 
they accompanied these two unknown men up Macquarie Street. We think that they walk separately, Mandy walking with one male and Debbie walking with the other male. She believed that uh, when they reached the mall area, they parted and she assumed that Amanda was going to the taxi rank to catch a taxi en route home. So it was absolutely essential we um, identify these two men because it may well have been that um, Mandy had gone with this man and that he was the person responsible for her disappearance. We had various descriptions, but in essence, they were people that were in their 20s and one was described as a man with a beard. We're very lucky in some sense because one of the guys had a, a bright red beard. Um, so, uh, you know, basically we, we plastered the media with calls of help to try and get these guys. As far as we knew, uh, she may well have gone with them and she may not have been on the taxi stand at all, or, or she may have been on the taxi stand and uh, then decided to leave with one of those two fellows and um, she may be still with them. This could well have been the person the taxi driver had said Amanda had been waiting for. Oh, yeah, I'm waiting for someone. But like the owner of the bag, the bearded man didn't come forward. Last night, the Hobart Police Headquarters switchboard was jammed with calls immediately after the Attorney General, Brian Miller, announced on television that the state government had offered a reward of up to $10,000 for information on Miss Carter's whereabouts. Wild rumours began circulating, with Amanda sighted all over Australia. We had a report that she may have gone to Cairns with an ex-boyfriend. There was people saying she was a drug runner. We had reports that she was at Swansea on the east coast of Tasmania in a log truck. She had gone to Queensland with a, a bikey gang. We had various clairvoyants ringing up and saying, well, we can tell you where she is and all these ridiculous propositions that one way or another you've probably got to follow up because you've got to be in a position to say, yes, that's been followed up and we're satisfied there's nothing in it. For Mandy's father, Don Carter, the past week has been desperate. Anybody who could throw any light or has seen anything that may be a bit unusual, uh, just to come forward and tell the police. You've got some information for me, have you? After about six days of the investigation, we received an anonymous call at police headquarters to say the three well-known criminals had left the state on the Sunday afternoon. She went missing on the early hours of Sunday morning and that they'd left the state and she'd gone with them. And they had left and they were due to report uh, on bail conditions on the Monday. And on the Monday, they didn't report for bail conditions. We thought that that was a real possibility that perhaps she'd gone with them, that she may have been abducted. Amanda Carter had been missing now for over a week. Police had information she may have been abducted by three known fugitives who had fled the state. We received a call from the police in Mackay in North Queensland and uh, they said uh, those fellows that absconded bail in Tasmania, we've found them in a stolen car in Mackay and we've got them in custody. I went to Queensland and after interviewing them all, I was quite satisfied that they weren't involved in the disappearance of the girl. Uh, they even admitted committing a crime on the Saturday night that she went missing. And in fact, they were terrified that they were looked on as key suspects. Another lead down, and the police were still no closer to finding Amanda Carter or the two men last seen with her at the Hope and Anchor Tavern. The two mystery men still kept coming up in our inquiry. We had to try and identify them. We just weren't able to. It was just bizarre that this guy with the bright red beard could have slipped away and uh, nobody knew who he was. They were crucial because they were probably the last two people to see Mandy and Debbie after they left the Hope and Anchor. We certainly were concerned about it because we thought, well, if they've got nothing to hide, why wouldn't they come forward? As detectives continued their search for these two main witnesses, or prime suspects, the results from the forensic examination on the yellow taxi were coming in. At the time it was impounded, police believed the brown bag found in its boot had belonged to Amanda Carter. The taxi was being examined as a missing person case. 
We were looking for any evidence for Amanda Carter being present in that taxi. I collected a Fanta can on which we were looking for saliva. It was an empty can, so someone had obviously drunk it. And there was a tartan rug which was in the boot, which was taken for looking for human hair fibres or any contact which might lead us to where we were looking for the missing person. On the right-hand side, on one of the uh, mudguard ornaments, there was a small amount of what looked like reed material. We couldn't find anything to connect Mandy Carter to that particular taxi. But in the middle of the back seat, the forensic people found a stain. And when we asked them what it was, they described it as a seminal stain, suggesting to us that uh, somebody had either masturbated on the back seat or that somebody had had intercourse on the back seat of that taxi. The scientists basically thought that stain must have been reasonably recent um, because if it had been a taxi, people would go coming in and out the taxi and it would eventually disappear. So it needed some sort of explanation. Highland was interviewed about that as to whether he'd had sexual intercourse and he said he hadn't. And he was even asked as, for example, had he masturbated and he also said he hadn't. He said that he was the only one that drove the cab. So uh, chances are that he was the contributor. So um, it was important to try and get his blood group in, so we asked him for uh, his blood and he refused to give it, which he was quite entitled to do, I might add, as well. The stain and his refusal to give blood rang alarm bells. But his alibi of taking his last passenger to Windermere in the early hours of Sunday morning checked out. We eventually found the woman and she confirmed that she had been taken home by a taxi driver in a car similar to Highlands and that he fitted the description and that was consistent. So that took the heat off him a little bit and we had to look at alternatives. A revised identikit picture was issued by police today who hoped the man may be able to add to Debbie's statements. After more than a week's search, police say they are both frustrated and baffled by the disappearance. Attention was back on Debbie, Amanda's 19-year-old sister. Debbie was traumatised. Of course it wasn't her fault, but she did in some degree blame herself. If they had remained together, she would have been safe. It was really frustrating, the fact that Debbie wasn't able to give us any information, or very limited amount of information. In desperation, the police asked Debbie to undergo hypnosis. We had been working really long hours, 17, 18 hours a day, and uh, the hypnotherapist was talking in a very monotone voice. My recollection is myself and John Blue went to sleep. And uh, so, um, but it was worth a try. We, we didn't achieve a lot, but it was worth a try. And at that stage, we were trying every avenue to try and get a lead. So we thought just a, a small thing may have helped us in the investigation, but it didn't happen. Then two weeks after Amanda disappeared, the police got a breakthrough. This young fella at um, Tutter on the west coast of Tasmania picked up a week old newspaper and saw what he thought looked very much like him as an identical picture in the paper. Contacted police and he was our man. It was a major breakthrough when we uh, had the two people come forward and say, excuse me, but we are the people that you're looking for. They were Stanley Hibbins and Lester Govett. One had a red beard, so they were quite sure that they were the people. Both men had left Hobart on the Sunday and had claimed to have no knowledge of Amanda's disappearance. But uh, they recalled everything that occurred and they said, yes, we went to the Hope and Anchor. We met uh, Mandy Carter and her sister Debbie and we talked to them at the Hope and Anchor and afterwards we left with them and they said uh, they put the time at about 2.30. They said they walked up Macquarie Street. Uh, Lester Govett said that he was with Debbie. Stanley Hibbins said he was with Mandy. Stanley Hibbins decided to make a phone call home to his parents in Victoria. So he leaves Mandy to make the phone call and he's talking to his mum for perhaps about 15 minutes, he says. When he goes back, Mandy had gone. Is he right? We actually went to Victoria and spoke to his parents and they verified that they received the call in the early hours of the morning. 
Garvey took it a step further because he said prior to leaving the GBO, he actually had a conversation with Manny. He yelled out to her across the road. And at that stage, she was intending to catch a taxi home. Yeah, I'm fine. I've got money. Yeah, All right, then. Fine. We'll see you later. OK, see you later. Bye. Bye. That gelled pretty well with what we knew. He virtually said to us that the female on the CML steps opposite the GBO was in all probability Mandy Carter. So uh, we had a time and we had an intention. And I think after that, that directed our investigations in a certain way. And that way was along the lines of what we first thought, that she probably got in a taxi. Go, 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 go. Amanda Carter had been celebrating her 22nd birthday. At approximately 3 a.m., she separated from her sister and the two men she had been celebrating with to catch a taxi home. <laughs> Numerous cab drivers had seen a woman matching her description near the taxi rank. Some believed she had got into the taxi owned by Wayne Highland. We were aware that Highland had previous convictions for assault and stealings and burglaries, but nothing of a serious nature. He was a, basically what I would call a small-time crook, um, a bit of a sleaze bag, arrogant, I would call his attitude, an arrogant attitude and fairly cocky. But the police had nothing to link Highland to Amanda's disappearance, except a suspicious stain on the back seat of the cab that was now providing some new information. There's a possibility that stain on the back seat of the taxi was just from an act of masturbation and all you would find would be sperm but there was a female component. And when you see that, you know, you've got a compound stain. The forensic people thought that there were two separate blood groupings in that particular stain. The contributors were a male and a female. So that um, we deduced from that and, and we thought it was reasonable that probably a male and female had had intercourse on the back seat of that taxi. But at the time we took the samples from the taxi, we didn't have a a sample from Amanda, we didn't have a body or anything, so basically there was nothing to do a comparison with. Wayne Highland had already refused to give a sample of his blood for comparison testing. But the detectives decided to question him again in what they described as a robust interview. Over a period of four or five hours, he was interrogated, he was interviewed, he was spoken to, he's conferred with all manner and means in relation to information was put to him. He emphatically denied any knowledge of Amanda's whereabouts. He was adamant that he hadn't picked up Mandy Carter. He was adamant that he never had her in his taxi. He still couldn't explain the stain on the back seat. How did the seminal stains appear on the rear seat of your vehicle, be it a taxi or a private vehicle? And he says, I've got no idea. Who did you lend the vehicle to? Has anyone else been in possession of the vehicle? All those type of questions. He had the opportunity to say, yes, I loaned it to a guy, I can't remember his name, he's a mate, he wanted to borrow it for a couple, but he didn't say that. He answered every question, gave an answer, but I had no doubt that he was uh, telling lies, but uh, we couldn't move him. He admitted what he had to admit to us. He didn't volunteer any extra information other than what he thought we knew. I was just convinced, I had that gut feeling that uh, he was responsible for the disappearance of Amanda Carter. Police closely looked at Highland's movements from the time he had taken the fare to Windermere and then picked up the brown bag at the steps where Amanda Carter had been seen. He said after that was when he finished duty, he had filled up his cab and then went to sleep at Windermere Beach. But there were no witnesses to his sleeping arrangements that night. But he had been seen at the petrol station. Two other taxi drivers saw Gerald Wayne Highland, the cab driver, known as Wayne Highland or Fatty Wayne, at the uh, service station. And he appeared quite nervous and jumpy. And they asked him what was wrong. Hey, at one stage, he told Is another taxi driver to piss off. Piss off. This was about 3.30 AM and the station was only minutes from where Amanda Carter had last been seen at the taxi rank. It was very much a, a very, very 
strong suspect. Then on the 11th of September, late in the afternoon, I received a call to say that there had been a body found. It was a body of a young female and it was strongly suspected that it may have been Mandy Carter. The body was found here very late yesterday by a trout fisherman along the end of a dead end road, Riverside Drive, which runs along the Derwent River. It's near Bridgewater, about 20 kilometres from the GPO where Mandy Carter was last seen alive 45 days ago. The position of the body was face down and the area indicates that it would have been impossible for the body to have floated down the river. In other words, it's almost certain that she was dumped here. At that stage, the tide was out and she was basically on a reasonably dry area. The hands were raised above her head like that, as if someone had actually pulled her along. The body was partly undressed, which indicated perhaps to us that something had actually occurred sexually. And at first light today, forensic scientists began their detailed examination. Police had to wait until the high tide before lifting the body out. The body was taken up by the mortuary ambulance and conveyed to the mortuary in the Royal Hobart Hospital. When it was there, one of the family friends came in and did the identification and said, yes, this is the body of Amanda Carter. We got a pathologist's report uh, not long after that and uh, there was damage to the mouth, suggesting that somebody had punched Mandy in the mouth and uh, that probably rendered her unconscious and an attempt had been made to strangle her. But strangulation was not the cause of death. Amanda Carter had drowned. As she breathed in the waters of the Derwent River, tiny organisms called diatomes were also inhaled. And these were found in her internal organs at the autopsy. Was her drowning an accident or murder? It seemed to me that there was a distinct possibility that uh, her head had been forcefully held underwater because of the position of her hands. But who had dragged her into that spot? As a routine, vaginal swabs were taken. On examination of the slides, we found uh, semen present. Uh, the most heaviest concentration was in the high vaginal area. And that's not surprising because she was face down with the tide coming in and out. The high vaginal area was protected from the, the water by the air pockets. And that's why we found some reasonable evidence. But at this point in forensic technology, there wasn't enough sperm in the sample to do any testing. And they still didn't have blood from their main suspect to compare. So for now, detectives would have to rely on old-fashioned footwork to find the evidence they needed to put Wayne Highland at the crime scene. Is there anybody that they see in this area here? Uh, any cars I've seen going in there, any fishermen that they know do come here a lot? Because it's a fair bit, but whoever dumped her here has got to know the area. We spoke to all the local people as to uh, vehicles that were going up, up and down Riverside Drive, and we had a number of reports of cars in the area. We had some reports of taxis. There was one report that um, a cab driver, a cab had been seen along there, and uh, the description given by the, the person was that the driver had a head like a bastard pig, which I think fitted uh, Highland quite well. When Mandy Carter was last seen alive after going to a disco on July the 27th, she told friends she was going to take a taxi home. Well, we at least know now in which direction the uh, offender has taken her. There doesn't seem to be any doubt that she's been driven to this area. We also did a lot of work with Holland's car, with the dirt that was found under the mudguard, and the best we could do was that it was similar to some of the uh, red dirt that was up in that particular area, but unfortunately they couldn't say it is the same and the grass was similar to some of the grasses that were in the general Bridgewater area. So we couldn't definitively say, yes, that grass or that dirt came from that area just north of Riverside Drive. It, it was frustrating because uh, we, we were very keen on solving this through forensic science. We thought that the forensics could tell us something. We thought that we would get something from that crime scene that would link us to Highland, but we didn't. The best we did from the crime scene 
were some of the witnesses that said that they saw a cab coming and going and a description of a person in a cab that generally fitted Highland. So once again, police questioned him. But this time, they took him out to the crime scene. He agreed to do this. He was very pleasant. Uh, the idea of uh, taking him at night was to obviously catch him off guard. We spoke to him there, and he, at that stage, said yes, he had been there. He said, yes, I've been here quite often fishing, drove the taxi uh, in this area, and, uh, well, you've got to accept that, because it's an area where you would do go fishing and an area where you'd drive your taxi. But he was adamant that he hadn't gone up there on the night in question, that he hadn't taken Mandy Carter, and uh, I can't tell you any more about it than, than what I've told you the last two or three times you've interviewed me. We, we had a circumstantial case, and I knew it, and I suspect that he knew it, and he wasn't giving too much away. He didn't move. You prove it. If you think I did it, charge me. He then claimed he was being harassed. I suppose to some extent he was, but I don't call it harassment. It was an investigation and uh, it had to continue. And I remember saying to him, well, you, you want to get used to it because there'll be more of these interviews. Uh, because we made it quite clear to him that we had no doubt in our mind and, uh, and in the minds of all the other detectives that he was responsible for the death of Amanda Carr. Eight months on, the inquest into Amanda's death was underway with most of the attention focusing on the seminal stain in the back seat of the taxi. The swab from the back seat of the taxi showed both Group A and Group B, but it was very difficult to allocate whether the female component was A and the male component was B, or whether the female component was B and the male component was A. Blood from Amanda's body had been classified as Group A, but the red cells were broken down and the result was suspect. To confirm that the sample the result that we got from Amanda Carter was a true A, we then examined the blood from the family. We established within a reasonable probability that her blood group type was A. So the A component on the back seat of the taxi could have been Amanda's. But was Wayne Highland's blood group B? Now, uh, the problem we'd had all along was that Highland had refused to give us a sample of his blood. So uh, we devised a bit of a plan after talking to John Presser, who said that uh, he could get blood groupings from cigarette butts, uh, saliva in cigarette butts. I gave him a cigarette out of my own packet and watched what he did with the stub. And I got hold of the, the finished cigarette and uh, put it into an exhibit bag and from that forensic people were able to determine his blood grouping from his saliva. The, the, the conclusion was that his uh, blood grouping was the same as one of the blood groupings that was in the seminal stone. But that evidence was not available to the court. At the end of the proceedings, all that could be noted was that a female with blood group A had intercourse in that taxi. It didn't exclude Amanda, but it wasn't 100%. I couldn't determine to the satisfaction of the, the magistrate that Amanda Carter had actually been in that taxi. The coroner gave an open finding that the 22-year-old's death was by drowning caused by persons unknown. So we basically put the evidence in the deep freeze and sat on it until we could find some better way of working out what the evidence could tell us. Oh, we were somewhat despondent, I suppose. Uh, we hadn't solved the case. Uh, we, um, we all knew the family quite well. We constantly said to them, we'll solve this case. We think we know who did it and we'll solve it. But of course, uh, at this point in time, we hadn't solved anything. But in 12 years time, things would be different and Lupo Prinz and his antagonist would meet again. After a night out on the town celebrating her birthday, skulls, 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 skulls. Amanda Carter never made it home. Six weeks later, her body was found dumped on the banks of the Derwent River. Police were convinced that Wayne Highland was responsible for her death. The stain on the back seat of his taxi indicated that Amanda might have been there, but it wasn't definitive. 
we always worked on the theory that perhaps one day uh, we would able to be able to analyse that material and it might tell us a lot more than two blood groupings, which is what it was telling us in 1980. And we were hoping that somewhere along the line, Wayne Holland would make a mistake or somebody would give him up or something that would happen. That wish came true. 13 years after Amanda disappeared, there was a revolution in forensic science. We became aware of something called DNA that had been applied in criminal cases in the UK, which was able to tell you a lot more than blood groupings. It was like a genetic fingerprint. That was very exciting for us because we thought that there may be a possibility that could yield a profile of possibly the people who were contributors to the seminal stain that we had. Swabs from that stain and Amanda Carter's blood were now taken out of the deep freeze and sent to a scientist in Melbourne for testing. Could this cold case now be solved? He got a result from the swab from the back seat of the taxi that showed that Amanda Carter contributed to that stain. And the probability that it is her is one in 140,000. It meant that statistically speaking, there was a strong probability that her DNA was in the seminal stone. In other words, he was virtually putting her in the taxi. This was really exciting stuff. I mean, you know, all these years have gone by um, and uh, we perhaps have got our man. It was time to catch up with their favourite suspect, now living in Melbourne. He thought the local detectives brought him in to discuss some issues connected with a bogus charity scam he was involved in. Then Looper Prins entered the room. He saw us and his face went quite grey, actually, and he was shaking and uh, I said, remember me? As you're aware, I'm Superintendent Prins. This is Detective Inspector Blue. You've promoted that. I have been promoted, yeah, yeah. yeah. a few times, actually. And, uh, After that, we exchanged pleasantries, I suppose you could say, and we put all the allegations to him once again. Could you have had any force with somebody on the backseat of that taxi? On that day, I have no idea. Uh, about that time? No, I don't remember. Have you ever masturbated in the backseat of your taxi? The taxi that you had in 1980? I don't recall. Could you have done? Possibly, I don't know. It's a long time ago, I've got no idea. No, but I mean, you would know. I mean, I think most people would know whether they masturbated in the car or not. Oh, I really can't remember. Did you assault Amanda Carter? No, I didn't. Did you kill Amanda Carter? No, I didn't. The forensic the evidence the was then put forward. Forensic tests indicate that the stain contained a mixture of both sperm and vaginal fluid. Those tests indicate also that part of the stain is consistent with what we call the DNA profile of Amanda Carter. Can you offer any explanation for that? No, I can't. Are you quite sure that uh, on no occasion that you had sex with Amanda Carter on the back seat of your taxi? Positive. Would you be prepared to provide a sample of your blood for scientific analysis? I had the same question ten years ago and I was told not to give it then, so I answer why should now? I don't know. I'd have to see a lawyer before I do anything about that. Is there anything else, Mr Holland, that you want to say about this particular investigation? I've just about had enough of it. He's haven't let up on me. As I said, then you, you hounded me. Looks like you're going to do it again. I had nothing to do with her going missing or her disappearance or her death or anything else. I understand the position you're in too, but I don't know why you've got to pick on me. I think he was conscious then that the investigation was ongoing. I suppose he thought after going to uh, two different states and 13 years down the track, he was a free man. <laughs> He thought that the police wouldn't chase him anymore and he'd got far enough away, but the fact is he hadn't. At the end of the day, we charged him and we extradited him back to Tasmania. I rang Don Carter and I told him that the family were very relieved that finally, after all those years, that he'd been charged. Once arrested, police finally had the authority to take a sample of Wayne Highland's blood and there was no surprise. 
His DNA fingerprint was clearly seen in the compound stain from the back seat of his taxi. Gerald Wayne Highland has pleaded not guilty to the murder of Amanda Carter on or about July 27, 1980. Crown prosecutor Damien Bugg told the jury his case would involve evidence based on DNA testing far advanced to the forensic tests available at the time of the original investigations. The trial proper began this week, but today it took an unexpected twist. About three days into the trial, Damien Bugg rang me at home. I think his words were, you've got him, mate, you've finally got him. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, look, this is the situation. They've approached me and they're offering to plead guilty to manslaughter. The murder charge was then read out again and after hearing it, Highland said, I'm not guilty of murder, but I am guilty of manslaughter. The Director of Public Prosecutions, Damien Bugg, told the court Highland tried to undress Miss Carter in the back of his taxi while she was dozing off. The facts for the prosecution were that uh, Highland had been working that night in his cab, that he'd gone to the CML cab stand. Amanda Carter was on the steps, that she probably got in the taxi and fell asleep. He got out of the taxi and picked up the handbag that was still sitting there where she was. He drove to North Hobart, and that's when he was seen by the other taxi drivers at the service station in North Hobart. Piss off! He then continued on out to Bridgewater, and he went to Riverside Drive. He then had sexual intercourse with her against her will. In other words, she was raped on the backseat of that taxi. After he committed the crime, he then tried to strangle Amanda Carter and may well have held her head underwater. And as a result of his acts, she died of drowning. And they pleaded guilty of those facts. Wayne Highland was sentenced to six years for rape and 10 years for manslaughter. A detective, when he becomes involved in a case which is so very personal as this one was, um, it becomes a part of you. And uh, it was extremely satisfying that we had our man. I've only spoken briefly to Mrs Carter. Obviously, she's very relieved. Uh, she indicated she didn't want to speak to the media, but uh, I'm sure the family are greatly relieved now that's all over and done with. Tragically, Don Carter died just before the trial and um, he never got to know that Holland was convicted of the crime. So that was very sad. But uh, for those of us that were there and were still working, it was a very satisfying result because we felt we'd, we'd kept our, honoured our commitment to the family. But in 2001, eight years into his 16-year sentence for the rape and manslaughter of 22-year-old Amanda Carter, Gerald Wayne Highland was granted parole. You know, basically, eight years for a person's life um, is, is very poor in the sense of um, punishment. Um, he's still wandering around right now. Mandy Carter's not. <laughs>